And welcome back to Black News. My name is Doris Davenport, correspondent. I am so pleased to welcome to Black News podcast none other than Congressman Danny K. Davis of the 7th Congressional District, Congressman of the United States of America. <laughs> welcome to the Black News podcast. How are you, sir? Well, I am just wonderful. And I am delighted to be with you, and I thank you so very much. You are welcome. Um, Congressman Davis, I have to say that of all the people I have interviewed and had conversations with over the years, and I had an intern go through a lot of my broadcasts, and I have had over 5,000 conversations just in interviews alone, and it's pretty amazing. But you, the conversations that I've had with you over the years are probably the most profound that I walk away and feel that I have spoken to someone who is wise. When, there are very few people that I would use the word wisdom, uh, sage. You fit that bill. You are somebody that I have a great deal of respect for and know that when people say, what are they really doing in the Congress? Are they really working for us? I can honestly say that when I think of your tenure in Congress, I believe that. I've seen that. Uh, tenure matters. You've been in Congress for our, almost a quarter of a century now. Well, yes, it has been a wonderful experience for me. And I think what I've enjoyed the most is representing some of the most fascinating people in the world and having people be involved and engaged. Last week we had one uh, Zoom town hall and there were more than 100 people on it at 8.30 in the morning last Monday. I was amazed. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have been on that town hall, <laughs> that, too. That, that, you know, <laughs> more than 100 people. <laughs> yeah. And we, it was a discussion about criminal justice reform. And uh, I, I had to leave because I had to run and do something else. But the people themselves carried on outstanding discussion. And, you know, we've made some progress mm. in that arena. And so, yeah, I'm, being involved in public life for me has been a wonderful experience. And every day <laughs> something happens, like I was having dinner with Brandon Johnson, as a matter of fact, uh, last Candidate evening. Candidate for mayor. Yep. And there was a group of ladies sitting near where we were in the restaurant. And when we got up to leave, one stopped me, and it turned out that she was the daughter of two people that I admired who were mm. my freshman studies teachers <laughs> really? in undergraduate school. Oh my goodness. And, and her, her father ran the student union, and her mother worked in the freshman studies office. It's and a small I say, world. are you kidding? And then the moment I looked at her, and her daughter was also with her. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a tremendous resemblance. <laughs> All three of them. <laughs> you can see look, it. Look very mm -hmm. much alike, and it it was, and it turned out that her father had started the chapter of the fraternity. Ah, that's right. That you I'm a alpha? member of, I'm an alpha. Mm -hmm. And her father had started our Mu Mu Lambda chapter here in the western suburbs. Wow. When I came to Chicago, it was for two reasons, black politics and black theater. <laughs> and those two things were, I mean, politics in particular. The black community in Chicago was strong, had a voice, and was really, you know, a mover and a shaker as a group and understood the power of the vote and understood unity and connection and community. 
And as time has gone on, you know, these last three decades, I wonder, I think a lot about what we've lost and what we've gained and, you know, how we can hold on to what we have. And I guess the question that I would pose to you is, we've had a great exodus of black people from the city of Chicago, the pandemic, uh, taxes, um, just the basic um, um, unevenness of the distribution of resources. Uh, we still see white collar crime getting a pass while uh, blue collar crime gets um, prison and time. What, two questions, what is the state of the black community in Chicago? And secondly, do we even know what the black voting population looks like today? Well, you know, when we think of Chicago, it has had a tremendous amount of resilience. That is, even though in many instances we've had whole industries that we've lost. I mean, there was a time when we were the meat <laughs> cutting, meat, um, mm. we were the biggest meat the packing house. And that was an industry that moved totally out of Chicago. And yet Chicago survived it. We were the steel producing place. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we had huge steel operations. All of that changed, and yet Chicago was able to make the transition. Mm -hmm. I think of corporate entities that were part of this community, for example, I'm a great Sears Roebuck fan. Mm -hmm. I'm a great Julius Rosenwald mm -hmm. fan. And, and all for many different reasons. Uh, this used to be international headquarters for Sears Roebuck and mm -hmm. Company. Their most productive store was right down the street at home in, in Arthington. I'm mm -hmm. talking about in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and, and everything, and then there was Western Electric mm -hmm. just a little further to the south where 50,000 people worked every day. And when the bail system was broken up as a result My of bail. antitrust laws and, and, and all of that got dismantled and that was a large number of jobs. I used to live near there and on the, in the mornings it would just be great see all these people getting off the train with their lunch pails mm -hmm. and buckets going over to work and they just had good jobs. Well, those were never replaced. They, they were, and then, I mean, there used to be so much opportunity in Chicago, Hot Point, Motorola, General Electric, almost, I mean, we, we were, part of this great mm -hmm. Midwest producing mm. area, all of that moved away as uh, transportation became more available, expressways and, and highways going away and homes being built in, in suburban areas now that used to be fields. I mean, even when I oh. came to Chicago, you could just go a little bit and you'd see corn fields and other kinds of things. Well, much of the population moved for a lot of reasons. One, a lot of people died. <laughs> <laughs> just naturally. I, I, I'm saying <laughs> baby boomers. <laughs> just the cycle died. of life. And, and so that, that group got diminished, mm -hmm. and then there were large numbers of people who, when they reached retirement age, they moved back to the South where they came from because they liked the weather more. Mm -hmm. And their bones liked and it too. And also their Social Security checks and retirement checks went a little further. I know a number of people who once they retired Back to Mississippi they went, back to Arkansas they went, back to Louisiana, because they could get more of what they needed because the cost of living was not 
as high. Mm. And then on top of that, we've also had the housing transformation where a decision was made to de-densify some communities because urban planners and sociologists and others kind of took the position that it was challenging and in some instances impossible to socialize people when there were too many people in too little space. So a decision was made to tear down the huge housing developments and attempt to replace them. But of course the replacement was nothing comparable to what existed. You look at State Street, when, when there used to be public housing from 22nd Street all the way down mm. to 55th Street, or you look at Cabrini, mm. you look at what used to be Henry Horner, you look at what used to be Rockwell, you look at what used to be Brooks and Abla, mm -hmm. all of those were, were, were diminished in a way and of course, there has not been the replacement yeah. of affordable housing to replace that which was torn down. Add to the riots and the assassination of Dr. King, and you have these whole swaths of area. For example, this area where we're seated right mm -hmm. now with all the vacant land this used to be a very thriving uh, commercial strip mm -hmm. where there were stores and record shops and lounges and restaurants and taverns. Well, there's never been a real urban redevelopment mm -hmm. program or the investment in these areas. And I have to give the current mayor a bit of, bit of credit because her invest south and west was beginning to take shape and there were a number of developments. Either ground had already been broken on the drawing board, new projects and new starts, and uh, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. that uh, somehow or another it did not catch to the extent of her being re-elected to have a shot at continuing that. And so I'm hoping and praying that the new mayor, whoever that's going to be, of course I wanted to be Brandon Johnson. I make no <laughs> bones about that. I'm pretty transparent in terms of, of my politics, but I hope that he will, will, will build on some of those projects because all of this has been fallow for more than 50 years. And it's not just in Chicago. I, I know people like to use Chicago as a mm -hmm. scapegoat, or but it's all over urban America. Yeah. It wasn't just Chicago. Well, the same it's disinvestment. Philadelphia. It's Philadelphia. Yeah. It's it's Detroit. Mm. It was St. Louis. Yes. It was Newark. It was all kind of places, and so we have not had the urban reinvestment, redevelopment. Although we've got some programs and some programmatic things and well, I'm going to cut you off you know. for a second because I do believe that one of the reasons it didn't catch on, and what will be different with a new mayor, is that we have to have a mayor who understands that part that investment has to be in the people and not just the projects, because if we don't invest in the people. And I firmly believe that is what happened. That is what has. That is why this administration did not get reelected, because people did not feel seen, people did not feel heard, and while you see a lot of investment, the people in the community will come back and say, "But that's not, we like the investment in the areas, 
it's not necessarily what we said we wanted. And that's important. And people are at a place now where they know they don't have to stay where they are. And it takes a lot. Yes. I mean, in, in, in terms of, and I'm not suggesting that it's easy to do, but I am suggesting that where there's a will, there's, there's a, a way. way. And, and every leader that I talk to about what need to happen and what we need to do, I always try and suggest to them that if we're going to reduce crime, if we're going to rebuild our communities, then the people must be an integral part of that, 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 that you can't just do it for them. You've got to be able to do it with them. And so when I talk to the mayor, the governor, or whoever, even the president and the president's advisors, I always talk about this business of block club organizing. Oh, Sometimes they it's look the at me. the best organizing tool. They look at me like I'm losing my mind. <laughs> what are you talking about? What, mm -hmm. what I'm talking about is put a little money into helping people come together themselves and figure out what some of their needs are. Don't take it, that, I mean, you know, just mm -hmm. a little, little somebody to be the coordinator, somebody to call the meetings, somebody to convene the people. Uh, when I started doing public work, one of the things that I did was organize block clubs. Mm. And I reached a point where I could tell in the hood, mm. in the community, whether or not a block had a block. I could just walk on the block. I could drive down the block, and I could tell whether or not they had a good block club going on. And a little investment mm -hmm. in that, I think, would produce dividends so great un un until it's unimaginable. I, When I look at the city council and I look at automatic representation in Chicago, and particularly in black communities, I think that when you look at their structure and what input they get from various sources, block clubs is on that list, but greatly underutilized. You were a city councilman for six years in Chicago. Um, how important was, were I know you, you worked for public service organizations before you uh, ran for alderman. So you, and, and like you said, that's when you, under, that's when you understood the importance, the power of a block club. What, why do you think that aldermen and women today do, uh, do not value or, and invest in block clubs? Well, I think it depends on who gets elected. I, I mean, I always try and support action-oriented elected officials, especially at the local mm -hmm. level. And it's not whether I like somebody or this person or that person. It's because of what I believe makes the most difference. I mean, I just love to see an alderman or a state rep or whoever it is out working with the people when they're not in session, when they're not down voting or doing whatever. And I think that's what it really takes to bring people. Like I'm amazed at when people characterize leadership, very seldom do I hear them mention elected mm. people as leadership, they'll mention somebody who's the head of organization X mm. or organization mm -hmm. Y, or they'll mention an activist-oriented minister. Mm -hmm. Very seldom do I hear them say that the alderman is our leader, mm -hmm. or that the alderman or the state representative is is leading us, is, is, is getting, and that may not be in their job description, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's what you do in order to help give people a sense of, yeah, we can do this. 
And I guess I've seen enough wonderful things done mm -hmm. by people who took that approach that those are the people that I like to support for who are running for public office. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I just feel good doing it, not looking for anything from them, mm -hmm. not looking for any favors, not looking for any special treatment. I'm just looking for individuals who realize that if they will provide leadership, and it's my position that you can't lead where you don't go. Ah, Reverend and, Willie and, Taplin and, Barrow. And you can't teach what you don't know. Mm. And, and so being an elected official means being more than just the debater at the sessions or the idea bringer but also being out there with folks, and, and they yeah. will respond. You're somebody who, you fought for education. This seventh congressional district is a, has a footprint in health care that you, your hand is all over it. Um, it, it, you know, speak to how that even came about. Well, social uh, activism and people like when we talk about, I often talk about lay people, uh, people like a woman named Earlene Lindsay, mm -hmm. who was an absolute champion for health care and education, or a woman like Miss Ida Mae Maul Fletcher, who was the premier education organizer at one time. Unfortunately, Mo got sick and Nancy both. They both mm -hmm. got sick early and both had cancer. And both, but there were others as well, a woman named Rosemary Love. We started much of this movement for health equity and pushed it. I've got more of what is known as the federally qualified community health centers in my district than you will find practically anywhere in the United States mm. of America. And many of these centers have budgets of $35, $40 million a year. And so people have been able to go to school, to get trained, to, to become nurses, become physicians. I used to be president of the National Association of Community Health Centers. And right now, I remember when we had three of the first 10 in Chicago, now they are serving more than 30 million low mm. and moderate income people all over the United States of America with more than 2,000 mm. of these centers. And they're continuing, they're, they're, I mean, we've got so many Mile Square, we've got mm -hmm. Near North, we've got Access Health, we've got Alvizio, we've got them in African American communities. The town of Maywood is developing one right now with uh, Loyola, mm -hmm. and and we've got the Erie Family Center. We we just got them, and so while we haven't licked the problem of health, but in Cook County, individuals can get basic health care. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, no, we, we, we don't mm -hmm. have equal health opportunity, but to be able to have helped write the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. and to have an intricate role mm -hmm. in helping to write it has been one of my real thrills in life. Mm. And when we talk about um, trying to redevelop urban communities and the role that I had an opportunity to play in starting the new market tax credits that have produced billions of dollars over the years. And uh, it was so funny because I serve on the Ways and Means Committee, mm -hmm. and we've got to reauthorize New Market. And um, the chairman 
a Republican. You know, Republicans are now chairman <laughs> of everything in the House. Mm. <laughs> but there are four people who, who've been asked to lead the new market. And a and, and woman named Terry Sewell from Alabama and myself will be the Democrats, and then there'll be two Republicans. And I was re just reminded that when we pass the new market tax credits designed to produce opportunity to redevelop and provide resources for neighborhoods like the ones where we're sitting, that it was Jim Talent, a young legislator from Missouri, J.C. Watts and myself who led that in the House, but Denny Hastert was the Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. and I brought Speaker Hastert all out here and drove around in his uh, pickup truck <laughs> looking at areas. Bill Clinton was president, mm -hmm. and and when I would run into President Clinton, he'd be, he'd say, oh, the Republicans are going to hold. <laughs> and I'd say, I tell you what, Mr. President, the Republicans, the speakers say they're going to support this. Mm -hmm. He said, well, if they support it, I'm going to sign it, and so on, <laughs> so on, so on, so And so, yeah, and that's just, it's difficult, though, if you don't do a lot of, what is called education for people to really know how these things come about. Yes. And, and, and even to understand how the political systems actually work. I mean, I, I hear people who say, well, you guys don't do nothing, you know, you're da 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 da. People got these faulty notions and faulty ideas about who does what and how, that it's as much of a process as it is the content of what you're Say dealing with. Say more about that, because that yeah, is you the strength. Get 50%. That's how communities get you strengthened. Got, yeah, I mean, you, you know, in the city council, you got to get 26 members. They, the mayor didn't do this. The mayor didn't do that. The mayor. You can't just talk you, to your friends. Yeah, you got you got to get 25 people to say yay. Like, in order to get a bill passed in the House, you know, you, you got to get uh, 218. 218? Yeah, you got 217 other Yes. People. You got to get 217 other people mm -hmm. besides yourself <laughs> to get something passed. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you get the stuff done, oh, you feel real good about it. Yeah. I, I, I mean... And and then you got to make sure that you can convey. I mean, like Illinois got so much money coming from the federal government, and that like, Illinois, oh, seventeen billion dollars over what time frame? From the infrastructure bill. Oh, this that one year, right now, yes, yes, seventeen. I don't want billion, to see another pothole. Billion. You shouldn't have to. <laughs> you shouldn't have to. <laughs> if they really, I, I, I mean, some If they good distribute the resources where the people need it. Child tax credits. Oh, my yeah. God. And some families haven't made use because sometimes they just don't know. Don't know. And trying to get the information to them. Like, and, and it just happens that much of my designated work is with children. I, the last two years, I had served as chairman of the Worker and Family Support Committee in Ways and Means. And of course, Ways and Means is the tax writing committee. It's also the committee that ends up figuring out how do you pay for all of these wonderful things that we talk about needing. Mm -hmm. And we agree a lot on what is needed, but agreeing on how to pay for it mm -hmm. becomes problematic. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. mean, Frederick Douglass, I, always, I, I quote Frederick Douglass a lot when we're having those kind of debates because Douglas 
was a guy who said he knew one thing if he didn't know anything else. He knew that in this world, you may not get everything you pay for, but you will pay for everything <laughs> that you get. That's amazing. And if you don't pay one way, you and so we'll another. have something on the table, everybody will agree, and then now let's figure out how we're going to pay for it. Don't raise my taxes. Don't, don't raise corporate America's taxes. Don't raise whatever mm -hmm. taxes. And if people are not watching this and understanding the difference when you say you're spending rel or when you're investing and the different philosophies, for example, there are members of Congress who believe that government has gone beyond where they think government ought to be. That government shouldn't be providing all of these services and programs. That government should just set the rules. And if you're educated enough and you're smart enough, you understand enough, then you know how to navigate the system to get from it. But if you don't get a good education mm -hmm. and you're not taught to read the stuff and learn it mm -hmm. and watch MSNBC or watch C-SPAN, listen to the news mm -hmm. every day, mm -hmm. you just won't really understand. Dr. King had a profound impact on things not only in this country but throughout the world. But one of the things that I always remembered about Dr. King was the song that he liked so much. And that song was, If I Can Help Somebody mm. As I Pass Along. If I Can Cheer Somebody With a Word or Song. If I Can Show Somebody That They're Going Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> then my living <laughs> will not be in vain. Yeah. And 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 powerful words. You know, if we can accomplish more of that, then I think we create the environment mm -hmm. that takes us out of the past into the future. And we know that we're building. It's painful sometimes for me when I go to a college or university to talk to students and they don't know the black national anthem. Mm. And they have to look at a piece of paper or when they're stumbling. I mean, they got great minds. Mm. They can do all kind of things. But they never took the time and nobody ever took the time to teach them the black yeah. national anthem, lift every voice and sing, yeah. <laughs> of what it meant. If you don't take stock of where you've been, you won't really realize how you got to where you are and won't have as much perspective about where you ought to be going. And so all of these things have to be brought in together and the more we do that, I think the greater our individual lives will be, but the more effective our collective actions will become. Amen. As you sit here in the shadow of a portrait of Frederick Douglass behind you, <laughs> And as I sit here admiring and so grateful and thankful for your time, um, Congressman Danny K. Davis, a man who convenes with mayors and governors and presidents and kings and queens and popes, you are remarkable, um, a true gem in the world, not just in the black community, but particularly in the black community. Um, I value you and honor you and 
from the Black Muse podcast, we thank you for your contributions and we thank you for sharing your time with us today. Well, you've given me my cake <laughs> and let me eat it too. <laughs> so thank you, Doris. It, it, it has been a wonderful, wonderful time, well spent, and I thank you so much and really do appreciate the work that you have done, the work that you continue to do, and you do it so unselfishly. You know, there are people who only do whatever. They, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't know what this volunteer stuff is and what it means. And I always say, I never volunteer that any time you see me doing some, I'm doing what I want to mm -hmm. do because Amen. it's a part of my self-actualization. Yes. And if I didn't want to do it, <laughs> I wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs>